morning. I'd like to welcome you to Newport News Church of Christ Bible study as we continue our efforts through the book of Genesis. Uh, we've been blessed with uh, some wonderful lessons so far by Brother Craig. And today we're going to continue this with the observance of how we go through Genesis chapter 17. We have a few slides to put together, so you can follow along with us as well as you don't have to look at me the whole time. So we have a few people here. We're a little shorthanded today. There's only four of us here this morning, uh, but I do appreciate you tuning in and being with us online. And we, we pray that this study will help you in some way. So when we talk about this, Genesis 17, we've had some lessons earlier that talked about from Genesis 12, the promises that was made to Abram. And that promise was that he would be a blessed nation and the covenant will be with him and his seed. So we go back to that. That was when he had left Ur. He was 75 years old. And when we get to Genesis chapter 17, he, we now read that he is 99 years old. So that's 24 years later after the promise that God had made him to become a fruitful nation. So when you think about that, the patience that he must have had to wait 24 years. So if you go back in time, what were you doing in 1996? So that was 24 years ago. What if somebody made you a promise in 1996? Would you have forgotten about it? There's a lot of things that we have considered that if it was important to us, we would have probably remembered. In this case, Abraham, Abram and Sarah both realized the magnitude of that promise of God of making them a great nation. What we have is something that we have to ask ourselves, am I really that patient? Because there's a lot of things out there today that we look through and everything is so fast. We have everything in our hands and our fingertips. But when you realize that, you, you get spoiled in that environment. And there's other places out there that don't have these luxuries that we have. And when we go to those places, are we then patient with others? So it's something that I know that I pray for, and I have to be careful in when I pray for that, because we understand when you pray for patience, it comes with trials and tribulations. That's how patience is developed, because otherwise it's just, I don't even know what the right word is for it then. But something that we ask God for all the time, but do we expect it from others as well? We have people being patient with us, difficult times. I'm going to ask your patience with me through this class. So do we have the patience that God has? That's long suffering. So then you look at that and you put yourself in Abraham's place back in the, the early days with the promise that he was made. And you look at the things that he had did when during this time. And you kind of wonder if I would have done the same. Am I that perfect? Am I that reliable? Because we have promises today that God has given us. We have the promise of salvation. We have the hope of heaven. All those keep us motivated. Just like Abram and Sarah, sometimes we fall. Sometimes we make bad decisions. And that's why we're grateful for the long suffering of God during this time that he has patience with us. So I wanted to make sure that we ground ourselves with this, that in Hebrews chapter six, and we have a good example of Hebrews chapter six, of a group of individuals that have been converted to Christianity that were considering returning back to Judaism. And when you look at Hebrews six and, and verse 12, it talks about be ye followers. Well, let me back up a little bit. It says, verse 11, and we desire that every one of you do shew the same diligence to the full assurance, to the hope unto the end. 
that you be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. For when God had made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself. That tells me that there are people out there that we can look to to help us understand what patience and faith really are. So when you look at that, you have Hebrews chapter 11 that he's referring to later on is that these people through their trials and tribulations experienced patience to a degree. And so should we. You have to be patient with your Christian faith. Here, Paul, uh, the author here is reminding them, find somebody that'll help you, that'll encourage you in your faith to get through these tribulations, to get through these trials, because we ask for it, we're going to expect it from others too. So when we want to make sure that when we're together, that we are encouraging one another to stay strong and to endure, even in this case for Abram, it's 24 years later. God doesn't put time frames on things. We know that for sure because he never told us when Christ would come. He never told us when Christ will come again. These are all things that we have to be patient waiting for. So in this case, Abram was impatient at times. But we have things in our life today that we, we wait for. Sometimes we have to wait to learn to drive. We turn 17, 16 in some states. So when you're learning to drive, sometimes it's the urge to drive becomes more important than the legalities. So you go out and you take mom and dad's car and you go out a little ride around. Don't tell me you haven't done that. So you go out and experiment, you get your little driver's license and now you've got your permission to drive and now you don't like driving anywhere. The other things are that you wait 18 years for school to be over. Some can't do that. Some don't like that endurance. They don't like sitting in a classroom experience 18 years for school, but some do. Some either progress further on through their, I can't remember what the way to that. Some would like to experience this thing and go out early. In my case, I got 40 years till I retire. I started in 81, this is my 39th year. I've only got a few more months left, come. I'm anxious, but when I started work, did I have the patience to wait 40 years to retire? But now I'm at the thresholds of that. And you can see Abraham in this position here at April, uh, in Genesis 17, he's in that same position technically that I'm in, that I'm close to retirement. I don't have to work anymore. I have to be somewhere at a certain time. Here, Abram is waiting. And he gets reassurance from God during this time. And it says you're waiting for sometimes with tribulation. But we're going to wait for our heavenly home too. So Abram, we have from Genesis 12 to Genesis 17, it's 24 years. God's plan that this seed was promised to Abraham. This covenant, this process was given to him through, because of his faith. Because in Romans chapter 8, in verse 25, that you see there, but if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it? Now, I, I used that last week on the Lord's table, and I was wondering, the real magnitude of that is that what hope is something you have not in your grasp at the time. I can hope to retire. I plan to hope to retire. And as soon as I experience, I no longer hope for that. So the hope that's out there and it's in me is now for hope for heaven, to become a servant here full time. That's a hope. To become a servant to God to a greater capacity, no with no distractions. And now I have this opportunity. Same with Abram. He's getting closer. We've talked about it in the past that now him and, and Sarai are both past the age of giving childbearing. 
and the curiosity is coming towards Abram. Well, it says, all right, now I'm, I'm 99 years old. When is this going to happen? So we look at this when we go back to Genesis chapter 17. Next slide. There it is. Slide three. It's asking the examples. And we'll read Genesis 17, starting at verse one. And when Abraham was 90 years and nine, the Lord appeared unto Abram and said unto him, I am the almighty God. Walk before me, be thou perfect. Hmm. When has he heard that before? Strive for perfection. When you look that word up, it means to be complete, to have an understanding. So we're not to be flawless, not to be blameless, but to, to a degree that you're striving for perfection. There's a couple topics here. We talk about patience and perfection because that's what God asked Abram to be here. Be thou perfect. God's appears advising Abraham, waiting for him to be protect, perfect. But Abraham wasn't. I mean, he was called out of Ur because that's where he was serving idols there. But he walked away from that. He left all of that behind, and now he's coming to serve God. That's a step in the right direction. That shows faith. We all do that to a degree. When we say that we're leaving the world behind and following Christ, that is the same analogy that Abraham experienced in real life, that he said, I am going to leave Ur, everything that I knew behind, and I'm going to go somewhere new. That decision is what every Christian makes as well. I am going to leave the past behind. In some cases, I have to relocate. I have to move. I have to leave people behind. People that I used to love or still love. To a degree now that I am no longer obligated to that old life. It's the new life. That's the strive, that's the step towards perfection that God is talking about here. So he's been good. He's been a good husband. He's taken care of Sarah. He has done what God asked. In cases he has slipped. He had went to Egypt went during the famine, wasn't asked to go there. He made that his own decision. He went with the Hagar. Again, another slip, but that was. His decision wasn't in God's plan. We make those same kind of mistakes to degrees. We make mistakes. So here it's showing God is showing to us that not only is he long suffering with us, but he knows our hearts and he knows Abram's heart. And he knows when he selected him out of Ur and asked him to go, he knew Abraham would. When somebody presents us the gospel, and we hear the truth. Does God know that we'll obey it? He knows everything about us. And that's what's comforting. So he's, he's there. He's my protection. He is taking care of us, even though that we don't know that. The more we learn and more that we understand God's will and understand his purpose for us, the more we start embracing it, the more we start trusting in it more we start relying on it. So Abraham made some mistakes, and I'm sure we all do. So in, in surrender to Sarai's request, well, okay, if this is what you really want. Can you imagine him saying that? Imagine my wife selling me that. Go ahead. It's okay. No, it's never going to happen. So I'm sitting there going, all right, so I, I don't know if I can relate to that, but he wanted a child. He was trying to, he was taking matters in his own hands 
thinking that he was striving for that what God's will was. Maybe not with Sarai. Maybe he thought it was with Hagar. But now, that's not it. So with Hagar brings Ishmael. And Ishmael brings turbulence. So when you have this kind of family situation at times, it does cause a little bit of chaos in your home. Maybe he was thinking in his own mind, this is what would really God really intended. Abraham may have accepted the fact that this may be all I get. Maybe Ishmael is it. So I'm, I'm thinking here at 99, he's making a choice that says, all right, I'm going to get reassured by God. And this is really the first time that really God comes to him in a long while, reassuring to him that I haven't forgotten you. I haven't forgotten your promise that I gave to you, that I will make you a great nation. And I'm going to ask you to be perfect, to strive for perfection. God through Christ showed us this was possible. Because that Christ came to this earth, he was the only one that was spotless, blameless person that had no sin in him at all. He was the perfect lamb of God. Here, perfection means to be complete. Do you realize that in Christ's Sermon on the Mount, Christ asked his disciples there, or all of those who are listening, to be perfect in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 48. First thing is a part of his Sermon on the Mount is to strive for completeness, to strive for perfection. So in that case, we have, and look at this verse in Proverbs chapter 19 and verse 21. Many are the plans in the mind of man, but is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. So we know that Abraham made his own decisions and we know through scripture, those weren't wise ones. God reveals his plan in his mind, not ours. So he has written to us the plan for all of us to follow, to strive for perfection. So be you therefore perfect, even as your father, which is in heaven is perfect. That's what Matthew 5, 48 says. When he met the rich young ruler in Matthew 19, verse 21, he asked somebody that thought he was perfect to change something. The rich young ruler liked his finances. He liked his money. And God knew that. And he said, sell everything that you have. In order to be complete, you need to get rid of that lust for money. The decision had to be made, and he made the wrong one. So things we think are in our right answers, but are not. God will correct us in this, always will correct us. He always wants us striving for that perfection. And we got 2 Timothy 3. We have every weapon that we need in our arsenal right here in God's word, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. So everything that's written down here is to help us to understand how to that strive to be complete, that strive to be perfect. That's what Abraham is being requested of of God. Be thou perfect. When you look at this, it says, I will make my covenant between me and thee, and I will multiply thee exceedingly. If you strive for perfection, then. I will make magnify your seed. Was perfect used anywhere else in this? I mean, we're in Genesis chapter 17. The strive for perfection was also requested of Noah. Noah was perfect in God's eyes. He had selected him just like he had selected Abram to be his servant because of his faith. Do you think Abram knew about Noah? This, you know, the words there, there was nothing written at this time. So everything had to be communicated through lore, stories. People would tell and sit down at campfires and tell things and, and go to families and relive these experiences 
one after the other, one after the other, to keep those fresh in people's minds so they didn't forget. There was no written word at this time. So Noah was an example of perfection for Abram so that he could now reflect back on, oh, I remember all of the Noah stories and how he served God for 120 years building that ark. Thank Mike Thornton for that lesson. 120 years serving God, building an ark and preaching at the same time, repentance. So he, he's the example God is expecting Abram to be. And he compares him to him, just like we need to be compared to Christ as our shadow of things that we need to be. See, he was wholly devoted to God. Verse 3 says, And Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him. That had an impact on Abram. He realized that he's been impatient with God over the years. And his first reaction when he was asked to be, first of all, being recognized by God coming down to him, speaking to him directly, that he realized that he was making mistakes. And that's that repentance that we like to see. And every time we get called out, that says, I want to be able to change who I am now. I want to be able to focus in that right direction. And that's what God's asking him to do. I am so close now of fulfilling this promise that I had given you. It's coming soon as we read further on down. Like, it is actually the next year that this starts to happen and Isaac is born. So we have this reminder, Abraham fell on his face. He's putting things back into perspective. So in this case, he lacked trust and faith on occasions. But now he was going back and he was trying to be like Noah. To be reassured. If I can get my next slide there. The covenant of faith. Verse two, and I will make my covenant between thee and thee and I will multiply thee exceedingly. What is a covenant? You can use that term too much today, do we? We use uh, agreements. We had an agreement. We thought things were going to be this way. Oral agreements, written agreements, contracts. We don't trust anybody anymore. Handshake's not good enough. Here, God made an agreement with Abram 24 years ago, reminding him of that. So it's been 13 years since the birth of Ishmael. And now he's 99. But I will make a covenant. Still not here yet. Still showing a future tense. And Abraham's thinking, okay, you told me that back when I was 75. You're telling me again when I'm 99. Does that mean I got to wait another 24 years? So the firm still future tense. Then down to verse seven, he goes, I will establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed. After thee in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be in God unto thee and the city into thy seed after thee. Now that promise is made is an everlasting covenant. Something that doesn't go away. That's agreement between Abram because of his faith. He didn't make it with Noah. He made it with Abram. Abraham was the father of faith. Even though Noah showed him that way. But Abraham became that individual God selected to, uh, to break, raise a seed a lineage, so that we can, we see this later on. It tells us that it got to remember this promise. It's everlasting and seed. Keep those two words in your mind as we go through this lesson. Because everlasting and seed, still today. Nothing has changed at all with that promise that was made thousands of years ago. 
So now we give it the good reminder to keep us falling on our face whenever we make mistakes, to keep us on the forethought of our minds that this promise was given to Abram. And now when I understand scripture, we can see how it applies to us today. God is telling him to getting closer, you got to stay the course. That's endurance. You're so close. Just like the older I get, the closer I'm getting to dying. That's the reality. So I got to think to myself, I am so close. I do not want to mess this up now. Because uh, you never know. At, at this age, anything could happen. So when looking at 17, verse 21, and he's given him some reassurance and says, look at, um, but my covenant will I establish with thee Isaac, which Sarah shall bear unto thee at this set time in the next year. Ah, I got a plan now. You've waited 24 years, one more year, you're going to get Isaac. He's already named him, and we're going to get to names later on. But he's already called him Isaac. So we go into this, this covenant. It's, this covenant is not circumcision now. This covenant of faith, the covenant, the circumcision comes later. But he's making a promise, an agreement with him and Abraham that says your faith and anybody that follows in that same faith line, that seed, will also inherit that same covenant, that same agreement that I'm giving you today. It's a faith covenant. That's what verses 10 through 14 it says, this is my covenant, which ye shall keep between me and you and thy seed after thee, every man child among you, then shall be circumcised. This circumcision is considered to be a token. The word token is actually used here. And ye shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a token of the covenant between me and you. What is a token? Is anybody giving you a token of their appreciation? A guard, a gift, something that says thank you for what you've done, who you are. They appreciate things. So sometimes they'll give you a small token. That's to remind you of what you've done for them. And it's also thanking that person for what you've done. Have we ever used tokens before? It's a visible seal or a reminder. A token of appreciation or a, it's related to these covenant commitments. Um, have we ever seen the word token used before? In Genesis chapter nine, what happened there was the flood. What token did God give us after the flood? A rainbow. That rainbow represents, I'm never going to destroy the earth through water again. That's to remind us. When Mike did his lesson on Noah last Wednesday, so 10 days ago, it was interesting because on the way in, I saw a rainbow. I said, well, what is that? That's God showing us, hey, Mike, I got you. I'm going to give you some, I'm going to show you a token here. And I just, I mean, I was grinning ear to ear coming across the modern Merrimack, seeing that, knowing that Mike was going to talk about Noah. I said, wow. That's an easy token to remember. Exodus chapter 3 and verse 12. Maxwell talked about that last one Wednesday. What was that token? That was the burning bush. That's a token that will always be in Moses' mind. I've never seen a burning bush not being consumed. I've seen rainbows, but that's it. So, and also in Exodus 12, we have those blood-stained doorposts to mark the Passover. That was a token of your faith and belief that stay part of God's plan is that if you go in your house and you put your doorpost with blood, then I will pass over your house and I won't take your firstborn. The scarlet thread. We saw that in Joshua chapter 2. 
when they saw that thread, when they destroyed the city of Jericho, they left that house safe. That's a token. <laughs> Mark 14, 44. Judas's kiss was considered a token. That of betrayal. That when I go up and kiss that man, that is Christ. That's the one you need to arrest. That's the one you need to put to death. In 2 Thessalonians, when we read that, verses 4 and 5, so that we ourselves glorify in you in the churches of God for your patience and faith in all of your persecutions and tribulations that ye endure, which is what? A manifest token. Of the, high, <clears throat> of the righteous judgment of God, that ye may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God, for which ye also suffer. It's reassuring to us if we go through these trials and tribulations and we hold fast and endure, that God considers us to be a token of his righteousness. That we are to be that shining light. We are to be... Christ like to see there is hope in this world. We can see that there is a way out. So when I look at this and I'm going through a trial or a tribulation, I go back to myself and I said, I need to endure this. Endurance is important so that way I can grow more complete, more perfect. And I realize that my life during these trials is being manifested, made known to the world. People are going to see me, how I react to these things. And that's what Abram is being asked here is this circumcision is a token. It's going to tell the people out there that you are a righteous person. That's what's going to separate you from everybody else. This was all done before Moses' law. This was all done before those Ten Commandments were made. This was a sign between Abram and God about circumcision. And we talk about that in Genesis chapter 17. So, the instructions for Abraham, I should have marked my page there, about circumcision. Go into all those details. The flesh of the foreskin it shall be a token of manifest betwixt you and me, and he that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you. That's for health reasons. God did that on purpose. This is a man child in your generations, and that he is born in the house or bought with money of any strangers, which is not of thy seed. Requires. So when you look at the word circumcision here, it's, all, it's about a cutting away of something. It's dead skin. It's useless. So it's signifying a consecration to the Lord. But this has always been in God's mind that it would be the heart that needs circumcised. And it wasn't a New Testament teaching that God has offered this first about the circumcision of the heart. When you look back at Deuteronomy, chapter 30, the last book that Moses wrote in the Pentateuch, it's summarizing it and saying, all right, during these times in, in the chapter 28, you're going to have the blessings of obedience. But then in chapter 29, you're also going to have curses of disobedience. But then there, chapter 30 talks about repentance. In verse 6, it says, and the Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart and the heart of thy seed to love the Lord thy God with all thine heart. And when you look at a cross reference between Deuteronomy chapter 30 and verse 6, it points back to Genesis 17 and verse 10. That circumcision of the heart is really what God is after. He wants that. The greatest command of all is to love God with all your heart, mind, and soul. 
strength, every bit of strength that you have. If you have that, he's got you. He's got your heart. It's a basic principle from Genesis 17 until now. And he's, and Moses is reminding these, these Jews here at this time that there is hope. There's a, if you follow your faith and love God, circumcise your heart, then you'll be able to have that blessed redemption that they so looked for. They had a difficult life, and some of us do as well. The New Testament circumcision is not new. We talk about that. So it's that seed and everlasting, those two words that I wanted to bring back to your memory that we talked about before. You can see the progression of it through the Old Testament. The, the circumcision bonding, and it says that the instructions were sometimes followed and not sometimes followed during the wandering in the wilderness. They kind of let that go, the circumcision of the flesh. So God always knew that would happen. That's why he, he talked about the circumcision of the heart. So when you see the seed of an everlasting covenant, where does that go? Sure, I got an understanding. It went from Abram to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob. And then the wandering in the wilderness after they leave and flee Egypt. And that's why the book of Numbers is so important. And some of these things is keeping that lineage straight so that you can see out of that tribe of Judah that Christ, the Redeemer, is saying it's part of that seed. When you go to Matthew chapter 1 and verse 1, it says... The book of generations of Jesus Christ, the son of David and the son of Abraham. Mm. Circumcision. That means when we have to have this done, it talks about the male child. It talks about those in your household and those that are bought with money. So who's he referring to here is slavery. You've taken somebody that against their will and you paid for them and they're going to serve you. That's considered a part of your household. They also are required to be circumcised. They are bought. Today, whose money bought ours? Christ. So when you look at Matthew chapter 20 and 28, the money today is Christ's life. He came to minister to us and to give his a life ransom for many. That's what 1 Corinthians 6 is talking about in verse 20. For ye are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. These people that he had bought, as Abraham had bought, are a part of his household. They were to be observant of that faith that Abraham offered. The faith that he had Sarai had his household, everybody was a part of that requirement. But if you refuse circumcision, and then he, it says that he is supposed to be cut off in verse 14. And the uncircumcised man child whose flesh is foreskin is not uncircumcised, his soul shall be cut off from his people. He hath broken my covenant. Refuse it and be cut off. That kind of reminded me of a few things in the book of John about the vine and the branches. If, you, if you're dead wood, you're going to be cut off and thrown in the fire. If you're engrafted, you get to take the nourishment from the vine. And that vine is Christ. And that's what we became, our engrafted branches. The whole Gentile nation became engrafted branches into the strong vine of Christ. But if you disobey or you refuse, your heart's not there. It doesn't matter about the flesh, but your heart's not there. You're going to get cut off. That's a serious offense. Now, Romans 11 and verse 22 it says, continue his goodness, otherwise thou shalt be cut off. 
It's no longer a physical act now. It's more of a spiritual experience, a condition. And we can see now how it develops in the New Testament because it talks about from the very beginning how faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We had a little discussion here last Wednesday about that. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. I can understand that today because I have the written word. I can see my faith. I can develop my faith. Back then, it was stories. The stories people tell. You had Moses when his mother taking him out of the river, nourishing him, his child and helping him raise him up with the Hebrew nation, having him understand his heritage. Not Egyptian, but Hebrew. That's important. There was no written words then. It had to come from parent to child. And the child grows from child to parent. That become another children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren. That same stories are passed down and passed down so that there is no lack of understanding or lack of education. So faith is shown in both in the Old Testament and New Testament. It's nothing new. Faith brought Abraham out of Ur. It's helping us today to get out of the world. That tells me. But the promise to Abraham's seed, when is that realized? In the spirit of what it was intended, in Genesis 17, when he was talking about thy seed, we saw in Matthew chapter 1, verse 1, that was Christ. Christ was that lineage. That seed had to be showing that it was pointing to Christ. Christ talked about it. We can read about it. But did it develop well in the New Testament? So you look at it when the church was, you know, the church was established. You have the birth of Christ. You have his life. You have his ministry. You have his death. You have his church. Now, this is the method on how seeds are planted through that church. In Acts chapter 2, in verse 47, they said, after that mass conversion of 3,000 souls, they were all together with one accord. Was that the same spirit that was used in Genesis 17 when he was talking about thy seed? Bringing all nations together. I would think so to the first degree. But it's not complete because it wasn't all nations. The establishment of the church in Acts chapter 2 was at Jerusalem, mostly Jews that have come across all the country to come gather together. When you look at the Acts, the book of Acts, and its progression, you can start seeing the Gentile nations start to appear more and more slowly, and to, to a greater degree to a point that you had Stephen's ministry that his, his lesson that he was given to the Jews, which caused his death at Saul's hand. That was a very important event. You have the Grecian widows in Acts chapter 6 that were talking about, well, taking care of those widows that were not Jews. They brought deacons in, Philip and Stephen. Philip is the one that went to the eunuch. He went to the ones that in Samaria. He was the one that was branching out. He was the first missionary going out into the world teaching people about this seed that you're now eligible to receive because that's the spirit of what was intended when all nations come together, the Samaritans. And now Acts chapter 10, you have Cornelius. That's to me, Acts 10, was the spirit in which God intended the seed of righteousness to be complete. I have now established my church, my brethren, my Jewish family has adopted it. The teaching has been broadcasted out to the whole world. The Gentiles have now been able to receive it through Peter. And then the circumcision problems arose again. 
in Acts chapter 15. And when you read about 15, it's talking about the Jerusalem Council, about a group of individuals that was enforcing the fleshly circumcision on people that were converted out of the world at that time. You could have been Jew or a Gentile, you're now in Christ. And when you become in Christ, they were saying, you go back to Abraham's law and go ahead and get yourself circumcised. And they objected to that. And they didn't think it was necessary. And there was this great discussion about it. And that was causing a conflict in the church. Still, the, the spirit of the law, of what it was intended in Genesis 17 about all nations, is not quite there yet mentally. I got my church. I've got broadcast it out. I've got people obeying it, but yet still have division. When I go to Acts 15, verses 22 through 25, finally, they agree that circumcision of the flesh is not required. And they pen the letter. And that letter, I want to write, I want to read it. I don't want to miss it. Then pleased it, the apostles and elders and the whole church, to send chosen men of their own company to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, namely Judas, surnamed Persabas, and Silas, chief men among the brethren. And they wrote letters by them after this manner. The apostles and elders and brethren the greeting unto the brethren that are at the Gentiles in Antioch and Syria, Sicily. For as much as we heard, that certain which we went out from us troubled you with words, subverting your souls, saying ye must be circumcised and keep the law to them that gave no such commandment. And it seemed good unto us being assembled with one accord to send chosen men unto you with the blood of Bar Barnabas and Saul and Paul. Men, they have hazarded their lives for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is the agreement that pleased that church. Now that to me, this is the spirit that what happened thousands of years ago in Genesis chapter 17, when all nations in one accord can become together. And that is the acceptance of everybody. No, just one group, not just certain people of color, or race or height, size, doesn't matter. The spirit of which it is intended that if you circumcise that heart to a degree that you love God so much that you give up your world like Abram did and came back to live and serve God, it's the example that he wants from us. Same thing to strive for perfection, that we have that goal before us now. We saw it. We've been taught it. The light, the light is out there. The words that are out there. Salvation is there. Salvation can be taken. There's no more hope of salvation. I've got it. I don't hope for that anymore. I hope for heaven. That's my long-term goal. When I have that obtained, then that's when rest happens. Doesn't matter what age. I can enjoy that to a degree. And I can go back, let's go to Colossians chapter two. No, I gotta, I'm not sure if I can finish this. I'm better, maybe I should stop. I didn't get anywhere close, sorry. I'll pick it up there. I appreciate your time. Uh, it is 25 till. We got to get prepared. Brother Greg is going to preach to us today. Brother Greg is, I believe, home. Or is he still in Tennessee? He's at home. So uh, bear with us now. We're going to close our service out, uh, our Bible study. I thank you for listening. Um, appreciate you being with us this morning. And we'll see you shortly at 11 o'clock. Thank you.